it played a big role in winning um, for workers basic workplace rights. Uh, you know, the, the Ludlow strike was basically a failure because uh, um, it, got, it got broken up as a result of the massacre and then the union could no longer support the strikers when they were out on strike. So it was technically a failure, but it made a big impression on people nationally. John D. Rockefeller Jr. received the Colorado Iron and Fuel Company from his father, John Rockefeller, for his birth date in the early 1900s. The company was composed of over 900 workers. The 900 workers were made up of 19 nationalities and 36 different languages. Rockefeller created this diversity intentionally. He sent recruiters into southern European countries. The purpose of this was to make sure that they couldn't communicate and form a strike. Miners were forced to work in brutal inhumane conditions within the mine. All the money that the miners received could only be used in company stores. In addition, the workers were forced to live with their families in company-owned houses, which were really just unstable wooden shacks. Working conditions were brutal to say the least. The deeper miners dug, the more danger increased of collapsing tunnels, gas pockets, floods, and getting trapped inside. The annual death toll in Colorado was more than any state. In addition to the danger in the mines, winter in Colorado at the time brought miserable cold and difficult transportation. The demands of the Ludlow miners are the following. Number one, recognition of the union's right to bargain. Number two, a 10% advance on tonnage rates. Number three, an eight hour workday for all miners in and around the mine and at coke ovens. Number four, pay for dead work such as timbering, brushing, and removing rock. Number five, a check weighman at all mines elected by the miners without interference. Number six, the right to trade at any store to choose lodging and a medical doctor. Number seven, enforcement of the Colorado mining laws and the elimination of armed mine guards. Rights and responsibilities played a huge role in the Ludlow Massacre due to the mine owners taking away the miners' rights. The rights to choose a medical doctor, safe working conditions, a normal education, and to choose where to live. It was the mine owner's responsibility to ensure their workers safe working conditions, better pay, and to let them choose where they live. It was the workers' right as American citizens to go on strike, but they had this taken away from them the second that the first gun fired. A huge part of owning and running a business is the responsibility to provide workers with fair pay and safe working conditions, the responsibility that Rockefeller Jr. lacked. The Colorado Iron and Fuel Company treated their workers more like cheap animal labor than actual working humans. They, were, uh, they had to shop at the company store. They were paid in what was called scrip, which was outlawed at the time. You know, it's a form of currency that you could only use at the company store. Um, they were forced to read company literature, kids. Had to, had to read from company textbooks. It was all about, it was all about the company. So it was basically like a feudal organization. The Colorado Field and Iron Company stubbornly refused to grant them the forcing 13,000 workers out of the original company owned houses, making them live in a large colony of primitive tents. The colony of primitive tents was located on land that was loaned to them by ex miners who sympathized and supported the strikers' union. The colony was under the leadership of Louis Tikas. Louis Tikas was a Greek organizer with the Union. He was very respected by the miners. The miners lived in this colony through the winter of 1913 to 1914, which was one of the worst on record. As the tension was building, the miners dug pits underneath their tents. This was meant to protect women and children from the gunfire. They were denied um, every basic right that we come to take for granted today. And they were denied the right to a safe workplace, which was probably the most important because they were dying in the Colorado mines at, uh, at twice the, nas the national average for coal miners. It's got to be Mother Jones. She was a remarkable activist and, you know, uh, a woman who is... Uh, should be up there in the pantheon of American gods for what she did for working people. If it's strike or submit, for God's sake strike. Strike or else every woman in the country will come and beat the hell out of you. Strike until the last one of you drops in your graves. General Chase had put her under military confinement in the San Rafael Hospital for 10 weeks. For almost another month, she was sat to a rat infested room in the cell of the Huerfano County Courthouse. 
After she was released, she headed back to Washington, D.C. to testify on behalf of the minors before a congressional committee. Then she came back to help the families cope. Without Mother Jones, the minors would have had a hard time coming together and strength. Rockefeller also testified in front of a congressional committee, but on behalf of the militia and his company, not his workers. As news reached Rockefeller Jr., he quickly denied any evidence that accused him of being involved in the massacre. Many citizens, however, still have protests accusing him of the violence. But the militia quickly sided with the mine operators. The mine operators gave the militia warm food and were very sympathetic to the militiamen. The militia had men with guns posted all around the camp. Occasionally there would be an exchange of gunfire, but nothing too damaging. Shortly after they were evicted from their homes, fights were breaking out periodically between miners and mine owners. So the governor sent the state militia to be peacekeepers. He put General Chase in command. The company had just had enough, you know, and I should say that the, the militia at that time uh, was pretty much taken over by company, company people. Um, it wasn't really the Colorado you know, National Guard or the Colorado militia anymore. All the tension building up between the miners and militia came crashing down on the morning of April 20. It was 10 o'clock in the morning. Many miners were celebrating Greek Orthodox Easter at the time. That very morning, the militia opened fire at the tent call. Who fired the first shot still remains a mystery to this day. As bullets pelted the colony, Women and children took cover in pits dug under the tents. As the massacre raged on, the militia set fire to the tents. It is said that kerosene was poured over the tents initially to set them on fire. In one pit, two women and 11 children suffocated under a burning tent. The men grabbed their guns and ran to the railroad to defend the colony. Others took shelter elsewhere, while some guided others to safety during the bloodbath. There was no Ludlow Massacre. The ingoing started as a desperate fight for life by the two small squads of the militia against the entire tent colony. On the day of the Ludlow Battle, a chum and myself left the house of Reverend J.R. Ferris, the Episcopal minister with whom I boarded in Trinidad. For a long tramp through the hills, we walked 14 miles, intending to take the Colorado and Southern Railroad back to Trinidad from the Ludlow Station. We were going down a trail on the mountainside just above the tent city at Ludlow when my chum pulled on my sleeve and at the same instant we heard shooting. The militia were coming out of Hastings Canyon and firing as they came. We lay flat behind a rock and after a few minutes I raised my hat aloft on a stick. Instantly bullets came in our direction. One penetrated my hat. The militiamen must have been watching the hillsides with glasses and thought that my old hat betrayed the whereabouts of a sharpshooter of the miners. We saw the militiamen parlay outside the tent city and a few minutes later, Tikas came out to meet them. We watched them talking. Suddenly, an officer raised his rifle, gripping the barrel, and fell Tikas with the butt. Tikas fell face downward. As he lay there, we saw the militiamen fall back. Then they aimed their rifles and deliberately fired them into the unconscious man's body. It was the first murder I'd ever seen, for it was a murder and nothing less. Then the miners ran about in the tent colony. Women and children scuttled for safety in pits which afterward trapped them. Although the official number of those who died is unknown, here are some victims that are honored at the memorial. This is the memorial located on the site of the massacre, dedicated to the men, women, and children who became victims of this bloody scar in Colorado's history. This memorial is a National Historic Landmark. It stands tall and strong as a reminder that many hardworking miners of this event paid the ultimate sacrifice for their rights.